Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined once again by Dr. Aaron Mayer. Many of you are going to be familiar with his work on the Philistines and the interviews he's done on the channel. I am very excited to say that this next series is going to deal with a subject that many of you have requested, and that is ancient Israel and the Israelites. Dr. Aaron Mayer, thank you so much for coming on today. It's my pleasure, uh, like always. So I'd like to start off by asking a very basic question, and that is, who were the ancient Israelites? Ah, uh, well, that's that's the sixty-three thousand dollar question, as they say. We'll start like this: the ancient Israelites um, were a group that was eventually identified both by themselves and by others, but to a large extent based on the traditions that come through in the biblical texts and the biblical traditions. Now, we do have sources that talk about the ancient Israelites or, or groups like the ancient Israelites um, from the very end of the late Bronze Age and onwards, and uh, not enough and, and too far, you know, uh, too few and far between. But they do enable us to sort of build a, a picture of who they are, um, where they came from, how they developed, uh, etc. So, um, for example, the earliest non-biblical source which mentions the Israelites is a an inscription of the Egyptian pharaoh Merneptah around 1200 or slightly before 1200 BC, in a description of uh, of his activities, mainly military activities in. Canaan, that's um, more or less modern Israel, Jordan, uh, Palestine, Leb Lebanon of today, um, uh, fought battles against various um, people's towns. And one of the peoples that he mentions are the Israelites. And he claims that he destroyed them. Now, that's the first mention. And then the name Israel is not mentioned in an extra biblical source for several hundred years later, um, till the ninth century BCE, and the what we call the Iron 2A, that would be parallel to the biblical chronology after the time of David and Solomon. This is in after the separation of the of the Israelite kingdom and the Judaite kingdom to two kingdoms. And there, um, they're mentioned, the Israelites are mentioned in three or four sources as the king of Israel, something of, of the sort. So we know that at 1200, let's say in 10 BCE, um, the Egyptians knew of a group that was somewhere in Canaan, Palestine, land of Israel, whatever you want to call it, that they called that group uh, Israelite. We don't know based on that source very much, just that there was a name, a group with the name Israel out there. Now, in parallel to this, you have all the biblical traditions, which uh, which give us a, a narrative of a very long development of the of the uh, the background and development of the of the peoples and the groups that eventually became um, the the Israelites and the tradition of the uh, of the the fathers of the Israelites and the sojourn in Egypt and then the Exodus and the conquest of of, uh, of the land of Israel, etc. Now, of course, the big question is. And um, again, if there are people here who feel very strong about the biblical text, you'll excuse me if I offend every, anybody. But uh, as an archaeologist, as a historian, as a scientist, um, we have to always question our sources. And, and the, the, the big question is, of course, what of the narrative that we're, we receive in the biblical text is historical in the modern sense of history, that it actually describes events that occurred uh, one by one uh, at the time, and on the other hand, what parts of the biblical text are ideologically oriented to try to tell a story from a certain, certain point of view, from an ideological point of view, spoken much later than the events that supposedly happened. So then when we have the depiction, for example, in the biblical text of the Exodus, or the conquest of the land by Joshua, or David and Solomon, or and actually any event described in the Bible, it's not that we say we assume it's not correct, but we say we have to use um, critical uh, evidence 
of trying to find other uh, sources that corroborate, uh, whether it's other historical sources, archaeological evidence that tell us that this, these, these events, depictions here, um, actually occurred in some way or another. So that's the problem when dealing with the Israelites. When we look for external sources depicting, telling us about Israelites, we have very few. So back to the question of who are the Israelites? They are eventually peoples who settle down uh, and somewhere in the 10th or 9th century, kingdoms were formed in what we would call now the central hills of Israel uh, or the West Bank in, in some, you know, jargon. Uh, and there you had the Judite kingdom in the south and the, and the Israelite kingdom in the north. And these people were, uh, had, had two kingdoms, um, which are probably um, the in it, the people that we would call Israelites uh, lived. Uh, although the kingdom of Israel is probably the original Israelites, the kingdom of Judah were the Judites. And once the kingdom of Israel fell to the, to the Assyrians in 722, then apparently um, the kingdom of Judah, Judah took upon it the, the name Israelites. And that's why nowadays when we talk about Israelite history, uh, for example, in the Iron Age, we're often talking about really Israelite history and Judite history, which we've put together in the same basket. Now, the Israelites, if you want to call them that, we don't know for sure um, exactly their components. And was Israel the only main component or the other components? And we'll talk about later the various theories of how the Israelites appeared, um, you know, whether from outside, from inside, you know, all kinds of different um, views on this. Um, what we do know that um, after the Iron Age, after the um, the first the destruction of the Israelite kingdom, and then in 586, the destruction of the, of the Judite kingdom and the temple in Jerusalem, the traditions relating to the Israelites during the Iron Age continue in various manners. Now, uh, to a certain extent, uh, that's where Jewish traditions coming from the Bible and other sources develop. And, and by the way, we have another uh, group very closely related to the, uh, to the Jews, the Samaritans, who see themselves as as uh, being um, you know continuation of the Israelites also. So it's a and from there the, the historical ball uh, ball rolls along and and things develop you know and and all kinds of different narratives uh, connected to it. Now let's talk etymological histories and origin. Where does the term Israelite come from? Well, that's a that's a that's a very problematic question. There are various suggestions. What does Israel mean? Um, one of the possibilities is it's uh, the end, the name is El, is one of the main Semitic gods, so um, that perhaps part of it. There have been various suggestions of uh, it, 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 it implying that they came from somewhere in Arabia or somewhere in, somewhere in um, uh, to the north of Israel, but it, that's very unclear. The bottom line is you have a, a group who is mentioned by Merneh uh, uh, and it's Israel, Israel, and by the way, the Egyptians at that time uh, didn't have a um, what we would call a um, an L. So anything that was with an L, they turned into an R. So it's actually written um, Israel, you know, something like that. Uh, and, and we see that in many languages. You know, for example, if you think of between uh, Japanese and, and English, you know, the the, the problem of the um, uh, L and R. So. So at that time, but it's probably Israel, and that indicates, again, we don't know what the group was exactly, who were they, were, where they were exactly, but they were somewhere in Canaan, um, modern Israel, more or less. Um, and the Egyptians considered them a people because along with the name Israel, they had the, the Egyptian sign for a, an ethnic group. So it was considered by the Egyptians some sort of a group. That's very interesting. I didn't realize that about the Egyptian and the uh, R. So that's really interesting. It's kind of like reminds me how there's no soft C in Latin. So in reality, everything's with a hard K, kind of like, uh -huh. Catholic, or if you want to say Julius Kaiser, or I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not too fond of saying Tacitus. That just ruins it for me. So I'll say Tacitus. I feel like that's what everybody's uh, familiar uh, with. Well, by the way, you know, the, the, the story goes that in, in uh, World War II, um, the American codes 
um, in the Pacific Theater, they purposely put in uh, many words with L in it because it would be harder for uh, a native Japanese speaker to to uh, to you know fake them. Um, so. I mean, that, that occurs in many interactions between languages. Uh, now, by the way, another, there has been a suggestion that another inscription mentions, Egyptian inscription mentions Israel from about 80 years before uh, the Maronite inscription, from the time of Ramses II. Um, this was suggested by a couple of scholars, but overall, it's not accepted by most. Most, most scholars um, read this inscription differently, uh, but even if, we should say that there is another inscription mentioning Israel around not 1210, but say 1280 BC. All it means is that um, that group later to be known uh, as Israel by the Egyptians and others uh, had a longer process of formation um, in this region. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us much more because one of the issues um, that why there is some ideology behind this is that um, if you go according to the, the biblical narrative, so the Israelites should be uh, enslaved in Egypt until they um, until the Exodus, and then they wander in the desert for forty years, and then Josh after the death of Moses, Joshua takes them in and captures the land. Now. Very often, um, the time of the appearance of the Israelites, based on the Merneptah and based on archaeology, is placed around 1200. And then um, uh, archaeologists and historians say, hey, guys, when we look at the land of Israel and the, and the archaeological remains from Canaan at the transition between the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age, we don't have evidence of a massive conquest uh, of the land. We have some sites were destroyed, but it's a, a drawn out process and there's no, you know, uniform military campaign in which these sites are destroyed. Uh, and going back, we don't have any clear evidence of the, uh, of the sojourn in the desert. We don't have clear evidence of the exodus, etc. So, so some scholars will say, um, oh, it, it's not in 1200. Let's put it back uh, to 1400. Let's put it back to uh, 1600, you know, for example, some have suggested that it's connected to the um, to the uh, um, to, to the Egyptians defeating the Hyksos uh, at the end of the Middle Bronze Age, and they say, oh, so the Hyksos are are, are actually the the, Is the Israelites who were kicked out of Egypt, and it connects to uh, a, a tradition that appears in Josephus, etc. But it's all so some of the people are trying to say, oh, we have an earlier reference to to Israel. It says, oh, they're, they're already around um, at that time. But that's a marginal opinion. Um, I mean, I'm sure the people who believe that don't think it's marginal, but I think when you look at uh, most scholarship, <laughs> it's marginal. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about the appearance of Israel, it's appearing, it's, it occurs sometime uh, before 1200 BCE. That's, that's, what, that's when um, we have the first concrete evidence. Now, what can we say beyond that? It's really hard uh, it, uh, to go on that. And that connects to the big question of who are the Israelites? Where did they come from? Are they coming from outside? Are they coming from inside Canaan? And all that complex issue. And so we've talked a little bit about the ancient Israelites, and I was hoping that you could expand on some of the theories as to where that they came from. According to the, um, the biblical narrative, um, the Israelites come from Egypt, go through the desert for 40, 40 years, come around through uh, you know, the Sinai, around the bottom, uh, come out in, in modern-day Jordan, and then enter into the land uh, at Jericho. And then the, uh, the miraculous conquest of Jericho and the conquest of the various parts of the land as depicted both in the uh, book of Joshua uh, and to a certain extent in the book of Judges. Now, from a very early stage of the modern research uh, of both the biblical texts, but more so the archaeological remains in the land, it became apparent that um, it's almost impossible to find evidence of a uniform conquest of the land around 1200. Uh, that we don't we don't see anything, and in fact. Uh, iconic sites such as Jericho uh, and a couple of other sites don't even have the remains from the end of the late Bronze Age and the, and the beginning of the Iron Age. So, you know, they're, they're even places which are at the center of the narrative, uh, things are missing. 
So um, for 60, 70 years already, there has been a discussion in scholarship about how to understand the, um, this, you know, the, the Israelites appearing. Now, one opinion, which was professed, for example, by the late American um, biblical archaeologist uh, um, Albright, or the Israeli archaeologist Yigal Yadim, said that, yes, we nevertheless can find uh, a few of the major sites which have been destroyed at the time, and we should talk about a military conquest. On the other hand, um, there were scholars, and I would say to a certain extent, uh, this was for many years the dominant opinion, is that the Israelites did come from outside, but it was a slow and, let's say, a peaceful process in which they slowly uh, infiltrated into the land, uh, into the peripheral regions, and then with time became stronger and stronger, and that's when they took over these regions and other regions. Uh, then a, a, an additional uh, understanding developed, which has various, uh, I would say, um, uh, you know, nuances in it, is that the Israelites, to a large extent, were local people, that they didn't come from outside, but um, uh, most of them, or all of them, were actually people who had lived in the land beforehand, um, and for various reasons, um, changed their identity, changed the way that they uh, they lived, and um, developed a new um, identity. And some people said, for example, these were um, urban Canaanites who didn't like the social order in late Bronze Age Canaan and escaped from the cities and, and you know, uh, and developed their own, um, uh, you know, identity. This is not accepted by most. Others say that these, these were uh, lowland peoples who escaped into the uh, into the highlands, and others um, say that it's basically in the highlands where the Israelites developed. Um, there, over the, the periods, there's been a cycle of moving from um, nomadic, semi-nomadic subsistence to more settled rural and sometimes urban subsistence. And so this was a cycle, and, and one of the cycles we see is at the transition between the late bronze and the iron age when the Israelites appear. So, and why do, why do they say this? Because one, um, we don't have evidence of many of the sites being destroyed. And a no less important as, uh, aspect is that when you look at the material culture of the early Israelites, a lot of it is very, very similar to the, that of the Canaanites. That um, you do have here and there things that may indicate um, non-local aspects, but by and large, most of the early Israelite culture and religious uh, uh, and cultic objects and all and and writing and names and gods, etc., that can be seen to be coming out of the the Canaanite media. So it's hard to say that they they, they came from somewhere outside in the desert and brought something new. Now, most probably. Uh, if I would, you know, assess the, the current status, the the idea that most of the, the Israelites are, in fact, from within Canaan is probably um, fits the evidence, you know, I would say in, in, the, in the most in the fullest manner. That said, it could be that portions of the Israelites also came from outside the um, the, the Canaan from, maybe, for example, from Transjordan or from um, uh, Syria or some, or, or maybe some from Egypt, because there's a very strong tradition in the biblical text of peoples coming from Egypt, peoples coming from um, from uh, Syria, from Aram, uh, as peoples coming from Transjordan, and it, and it and it doesn't mean that it's accurate, but perhaps there's something in these memories, uh, and then and then again the people of Israel were not just those people who were called Israel by the Egyptians, by Merenthah, but it might have been that that was the name of a dominant family, a dominant clan, with which time, um, perhaps due to a charismatic leader or something of the sort, they gathered the other groups and clans together at, with the various traditions. Oh, yes, I came from Egypt, you came from Aram, well, I was local, etc., and all this uh, intermingled into this into this uh, entity, which one of its forms was being called Israel. 
And for example, when you talk about them coming from possible outside sources, that reminds me about Abraham and the possibility of him being from Ur. Would you expand a little bit on that? That's a very good example of if Abraham's from Ur of the Chaldees. Ur is a very important Mesopotamian, a southern Mesopotamian city. The Chaldees, though, the Chaldeans appear much, much later in history. Um, so again, there might uh, there there is a very strong tradition of the the three fathers of Israel, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, coming from outside of uh, Israel, coming from the Mesopotamian or the Syrian or the Aramean uh, sphere. But of course, the big question is: Is the historical order of first the patriarchs, the the, the three fathers, then the uh, then the uh, then the sojourn in Egypt and the and the Exodus and the conquest of the land is that the real historical uh, order or perhaps is the traditions of the patriarchs something that was inserted into the biblical narratives at, at another stage and and turned into you know a historical um, process which might be all mixed together you know that's that's of course that's the basic problem with reading with reading the biblical text do we accept the the um, the historical, you know, process and and development and chain as written in the biblical uh, text um, as a given. Uh, and for example, some scholars will say the patriarchs they weren't in the Middle Bronze Age or little or the Late Bronze Age, you know, before the uh, Egypt. They were actually at the time. Some will say they're at the time of the uh, Iron One, the beginning, the, the the Israelite appearance in Canaan. Some people say no. They're much later. They're, they're post Iron Age, even some people will claim. So, I mean, it's a very big question of who these people are, what the traditions, and that's part of the issue is that the biblical texts, by and large, represent a um, this combination, this entanglement of traditions coming from different groups, different peoples, and different periods, which are then put together into this uh, thing now i like i like uh, relating to the biblical text it's like an arch it's a multi-layered archaeological tale so uh, when you look at the biblical text first of all there are various components that were made at different times but it's just like an archaeological tale sometimes you can have intrusive materials that are going go from a, a higher level down or sometimes uh, a little rascal um, mole brings something from a lower level up uh, and and you can have a very big uh, mix up here. So in, a, in an ancient source as the biblical text, which has gone through this enormous process of composition and editing, we can't, from a scientific point of view, assume that this is the picture that we have. Now, from, from a, a religious point of view, you know, if you want to read the biblical text and, and uh, relate to its uh, you know, it's the religious message is coming from, that's fine. But if you want to relate to it as a, a source from which you try to build the history as in the modern sense of the of this region at the time, we have to use it very critically and 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 sometimes, you know, take it apart and put it together again. To really give a insight into the ancient Israelites, I was hoping for people who may not be as familiar with the subject, would you expand and hit us with the tribal names of the ancient Israelites? Well, according to the biblical text, there are 12 tribes, uh, and, and these tribes are in the biblical narrative appear um, in throughout the um, the history of the, of the Israelites from the time of Jacob, the forefather, because the, 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 the 12 tribes are named after his sons and two of his grandsons. Um, and they play a role in the Exodus, they play a role in the conquest, uh, and they play a role in the depiction of the period before the monarchy in the biblical text of the judges, where one of the judges comes from each of the 12 tribes. The big question is, though, are those tribes historical? Was there really a Reuven, a Levi, a Shimon, a Judah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, or were these tribe names based on some later concept of who, who, they, who comprised the Israelites? Maybe some of them are real. Maybe some of them are imagined. Maybe they were in different forms, et cetera. And scholarship is very, very, you know, confused about this. And there are various opinions on it, whether the, uh, the tribes do represent the actual uh, format 
of the early Israelite society. And for example, um, there was a scholar, uh, a famous German scholar, Nott, who tried to suggest that there was a, uh, a tribal league similar in Israel, similar to the tribal leagues we had, we know of in ancient Greece. Um, or was this something that formed later or all the way to the to, to, to opinions that it's a complete uh, fabrication of a later period? Now, whatever the case, in my opinion, the fact that there is a tradition that the early Israelite society was comprised, comprised of tribes tells us of the complexity and multi-level layers uh, of the Israelite uh, society, not only before the monarchies, but also during the monarchies, because we have a uh, uh, sort of a, when, when we look at ancient history, I'm sure you're familiar with this from other contexts, yeah, but it's very easy and, and very convenient to look things at very simplistic, straightforward, black and white pictures, is that there was a king sitting in the kingdom, and he controlled everything, and he sent out his messenger to the end of the end of the kingdom, and every did ex everything did exactly what he said. Um, doesn't happen today, didn't happen then. Uh, and, and ancient kingdoms uh, were, were what we call patronage systems. That means that you had a, um, a, a leader who was slightly more charismatic, who uh, due to all kinds of coalition politics managed to get various local leaders um, to, to, be, you know, to, uh, to be loyal to him. And he had to give them and they had to give them. And there was a back and forth. And every once in a while, someone was not satisfied. So he changed... Uh, uh, loyalty to another king and, and back and forth. So it means that um, ancient Israel society was comprised of, of clans and, and families and tribes and regional leaders uh, who lived in various parts of the land. And at various stages, they were affiliated with the king who was in Jerusalem, the king who was in Samaria. And even the, the, the biblical tradition about the kings in Israel, the, the capital moves around from various places. Uh, there's various dynasties who rule who are the kings of Israel throughout the, the history of the kingdom of Israel. So it's a very complex and messy process that's going on. So I think Israelite society was messy, just like a modern, uh, traditional Middle Eastern society is messy. And listen, we're still suffering today in the Middle East from the fact that in the 1920s, uh, a French and a British uh, diplomats by the name of Sykes and Picot uh, drew the borders of, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the countries based on their concepts of nationality without taking into account not tribes and not religions, etc. And until today, uh, the place is in, a, is in mayhem because of that. Uh, and um, look at any country you talk about. I mean, in the Middle East, I mean, not only in Israel and Palestine, think of Iraq, think of, uh, of, of Syria, what's going on, think of, of, of Lebanon, the, the enormous problems that, that occurred because of uh, various groups, national, um, ethnicities, tribes, uh, religions that are all living together in this very complex situation. And these things existed throughout, uh, throughout time. So I think the, the, the traditions of the 12 tribes it doesn't matter whether they are exactly historical and all the names did exist. And we don't have evidence of all the names, but we, it, it tells us of the makeup of Israelite society. And so Brian Anderson had asked a really interesting question, and my fans love the topic of ancient DNA. And so my question from Brian Anderson is, has modern DNA studies told us anything about these ancient Israelites? Okay, um, that's a great study, a great question, um, and it is also a question with a lot of, um, you know, uh, I was a lot of minefields in it because ancient DNA is a a revolution in the study of the ancient world, no question about it, and it will tell us a lot about the um, the biological relatedness of various groups. And not only related to Israelites, it related to, uh, I don't know, people in Australia, whatever, you know. Um, that said, um, all too often, it's used as sort of like the, the, the new magical silver bullet to explain uh, antiquity. And uh, one of the things that we know today is that um, culture is not necessarily dictated by genes. Uh, and... You can be related to some people genetically who you're very close culturally, but you can also be um, very not related culturally 
and I, and, and your fire your identity as far as your uh, D, your DNA goes. So it's uh, you have to be very very careful uh, in in the various interpretations of saying be well you know you'll excuse me and I hope I don't offend any of these companies you know all these companies that do genetic uh, things and then they say you're seven percent Irish and fourteen percent um, Welsh and uh, and and there's a Spanish uh, component you know? It, it sounds to me like a lot of crap, if you, if you excuse my French, <laughs> uh, because because although um, there are typical haplotypes of the various groups in the various areas, but you know you go to any country today in any region today, they'll have this mixture of people who, uh, uh, from from the same genetic background with different beliefs. Um, not only political and religious and, and identity, uh, et cetera. You know, you go to any Thanksgiving dinner in the United States today uh, and you hear the arguments over politics. So <laughs> they're, they're all genetic related, you know. So, uh, so the, uh, the, it's same, this, that same. Now, with that said, um, the, the, the DNA evidence that we do have from modern Jews, let's say various Jewish communities throughout the world, show that there is a lot of commonality, genetic commonality between Jews, and that there does seem to be a connection and a similarity with, um, with DNA that, that is typical of the area of the Levant. That said, probably the people who are most similar are the Israelites, the modern Israelis, and the modern Palestinians. So, you know, there you go. You know, so what does that mean? It means that they had a lot of common ancestors, uh, and and it could be some of the Palestinians were originally Jews who converted to uh, Christianity and then to Islam, etc., and all kinds of things like that. But at the end of the day, the two groups which see themselves as opposing themselves politically, um, you know, from every way you look at it, um, are genetically very closely related. So it's it, there's always a problem there. What what does the DNA tell you? It really, at the end of the day, it tells you biological relatedness. Then we have to take on all kinds of other aspects, history, archaeological evidence, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we can build a picture of, of uh, who the various groups are. That, and, but, but I would say that the, the DNA evidence that we do have show quite clearly that the, the, the most of the Jews that we know throughout the world are biologically related and they seem to uh, source, for the most part, from this region. Of course, over the centuries, Jews who lived in all kinds of places, you know, uh, there was intermarriage between various groups. So you do have various elements coming in. But for example, you know, there's this theory about that the Jews are all Ashkenazi Jews are all Khazars who were uh, who were uh, converted to Judaism and then moved to Eastern Europe. Uh, so genetically, that's shown to be um, totally base baseless, just as most historians I think it's totally base uh, baseless. So I would say that the um, DNA gives us a picture which doesn't contradict the general narrative of understanding of who, who the Jews were, uh, both how Jews. Jewish communities today developed, and how Jewish uh, Jewish communities in the past developed, um, and so that's what I would say the most important thing about DNA uh, now. One thing you had brought up in our series on the Philistine was their diet and how the study of those diets can really tell us a lot about who these people were and shed more light on them. And I was hoping you could do the same for the ancient Israelites as well. Okay, um, well, one of the the I would say the clearest cultural aspects of, of Judaism for many centuries was the very unique uh, Jewish diet or the taboos, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat. Um, you couldn't eat pig. You had to slaughter animals in a certain way. You don't mix meat and meat, milk and all kinds of things like that. Um, the question, of course, uh, when was when were these tradition forms and when did they um, uh, you know, can we trace them back archaeologically? Because we know historically, already Greek authors talk about um, um, you know Jewish dietary preferences, and this is something that's mentioned in the biblical text. So the question is, can we talk about these dietary preferences and taboos already way back in with the early Israelites? Now, for many many years, it was thought that we have a very nice example here uh, regarding um, pig consumption, because. In 
many sites identified as Israelite. There was little or no pig. Uh, and, and sites, for example, of the Philistines, we had pig. So it was said, you want to differentiate what site is, uh, is Philistine, what site is Israelite. If I have pig, it's Philistine. If you don't have pig, it's Israelite. What's the problem? It became a little more complicated. First of all, it turns out that at the during the early Iron Age, the, the Canaanites also didn't eat pig. And then even more complex than that, it turns out that at some sites that we consider Israelite, particularly in the northern Israelite kingdom, uh, there is consumption of pig, while at the at um, southern uh, Judite sites, there's much less consumption of pig. That said, an article is about to appear in which in the excavations of the city of David in the late Iron Age, which with no doubt is Judite, um, they found a little piglet in a, in a house. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that even the supposedly clear-cut differentiation between pig and no pig, you know, Jew, non-Jew, or Israelite, non-Israelite, is a little uh, iffy. Now, another example is, um, uh, according to Jewish tradition, what we call kashrut, the Jew Jewish dietary uh, traditions, nowadays there are certain types of fish that you can eat and, and you can't eat. Uh, and it's usually if they have uh, gills or, or scales. Now, um, uh, catfish is not considered kosher today. But um, you find in uh, Iron Age Jerusalem, Judai Jerusalem, catfish um, uh, imported from Egypt. So it means, for example, as far as uh, uh, catfish, um, they didn't, they, somebody was not, uh, uh, was not uh, you know, doing it. Uh, and the same thing, for example, can we show evidence of, of separation between milk and meat? Right now, we don't know, but archaeology is starting to, uh, to have the tools which may give us an ability to say this, because, for example, now, in archaeology, both organic residue analysis of the contents of vessels and uh, proteomics, which is we can identify protein, proteins of various foods, that may in the future give us some insight, some you know window into perhaps can we, yes, talk about when... The tradition of uh, the, Jew the later Jewish tradition of separating milk and meat, uh, can we find where it first appears archaeologically? Is it something in the Iron Age or is it something, you know, in the Hellenistic Roman period? Because by then we know for sure. But the question is, could we place it, you know, uh, archaeologically? But that's, again, still up in the air and hopefully sometime in the future we might be able to have uh, more insights on that. I've seen a lot of references between people discussing ancient Israel online, and one gentleman had pointed out that he thought the term Hebrew and Israelite were not the same thing. And I was curious about that. And in your opinion, what are your thoughts on that? Can you use one term to describe the other or no? Well, um, there's uh, there are various terms that are used in, in various ancient sources to describe. So you have the Israelites, and you're also... Um, and sometimes the, the, the let's say the quote, Israelites or, or cognate groups are called the Hebrews. Now, um, it's not clear exactly what what they indicate. And again, because it could mean that they're the various groups that develop differently and over time. Now, one of the things that has to be shot down immediately is um, for many, many years, and still you hear today, it was popular to say that the Hebrews, the, the, the etymology, etymological basis of Hebrew is the Habiru. The the the, um, the the sort of the the the, the semi nomadic or you know uh, um, uh, groups that that are mentioned in Egyptian sources and other uh, and 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 the Mesopotamian sources which were sort of like marginal in society. So it was said that uh, Hebrews are Habirus. Now what probably is is Habirus is a social class. Some of the people who were called Hebrews. Ivrim in, in, in Hebrew may have been Habirus also, but it doesn't mean that every Habiru is a Hebrew and every Hebrew came from a, uh, um, uh, the Habiru. They're used in various um, uh, terms. And for example, very often in the context of the, uh, of the patriarchs, the mention of the, of the, of the, of the Hebrews. And again, um, what does this tell us about the original use? Uh, 
what was added in later, what's uh, and what's an um, um, ideological understanding of later, et cetera. And that just so shows again the complexity of the of who these these groups were that formed into what later became the Israelite kingdom and the Judite kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today at the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. I hope you've enjoyed what we've done so far. This is actually just the first part of the series on ancient Israel. We've got more stuff coming, so stick with us. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to get into more. And Dr. Aaron Mayer, thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure. Great to be here.